Breastfeeding promotion and support greatly influences infant health. The World Health Organization recommends that infants should be given only breast milk for the first six months of life. Breast milk contains all of the nutrients that a newborn requires and gives a child the best start to a healthy life. In the U.S., about 75% of babies start out being breastfed. Yet, by the age of six months, when solid foods should begin to be introduced into the child's diet along with the breast milk, only 15% of infants in the United States were still breastfed exclusively. Education about breastfeeding typically begins with health care providers. Breastfeeding may seem like common sense to most of us, but it wasn't that long ago that the general thinking was that mothers should not breastfeed, but they should formula feed their babies instead because they thought the formula feeding would be more nutritious for the babies. Although breastfeeding should be recommended and encouraged for almost all new mothers, it's important to remember that the decision to breastfeed is a personal choice. In some rare cases, a woman is unable to breastfeed or it's not in the baby's best interest. Throughout this chapter, we will examine how dietary choices impact health and wellness during pregnancy and the early childhood years. According to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the human being has a lifespan of 130 years. People of all ages need the same basic nutrients, essential amino acids, carbohydrates, essential fatty acids, and 28 vitamins and minerals. The major stages of the human life cycle are pregnancy, infancy, toddler years, childhood, puberty, older adolescence, adulthood, middle age, senior years, or old age. Pregnancy lasts about 40 weeks. At conception, a sperm cell fertilizes an egg cell, creating a zygote, which rapidly divides into multiple cells to become an embryo. Throughout this entire process, a pregnant woman's nutritional choices affect not only fetal development, but also her own health and the future health of her newborn. Some of the major changes that occur during pregnancy are the branching of nerve cells to form primitive neural pathways at eight weeks. At the 20 week mark, it's possible to know the sex of the baby. At 28 weeks, the unborn baby begins to add body fat in preparation for life outside the womb. During infancy, a number of major physiological changes occur. The trunk of the body grows faster than the arms and legs while the head becomes less prominent in comparison to the limbs. Organs and organ systems grow at a rapid rate, and developmental milestones include sitting up without support, learning to walk, teething, and vocalizing. All of these changes require adequate nutrition to ensure development at the appropriate rate. Major physiological changes continue into the toddler years. Now the limbs grow much faster than the trunk, which gives the body a more proportionate appearance. As the child grows, bone density increases and bone tissue gradually replaces cartilage. This is called ossification. Developmental milestones in the toddler years include running, drawing, toilet training, and self-feeding. From pregnancy through the toddler years, children are entirely dependent on parents or caregivers for nutrients. Parents also help to establish a child's eating habits and attitudes towards food. So adults must be mindful of the choices they make and how those choices influence a young child's development, health, and overall well-being. Good nutrition is vital for any pregnancy, and it not only helps an expectant mother to remain healthy, but it also impacts the development of the fetus and ensures that the baby thrives in infancy and beyond. During pregnancy, a woman's needs increase for certain nutrients more than for others. If these nutritional needs are not met, infants could suffer from low birth weight, among other developmental problems. In the early days of pregnancy, major changes begin to occur, often weeks before a woman even knows that she's pregnant. During this period, adequate nutrition supports cell division, tissue differentiation, and organ development. 
Therefore, women who are trying to conceive should make proper dietary choices to ensure the delivery of a healthy baby. Fathers-to-be should also consider their eating habits. If a pregnant woman doesn't gain enough weight, her unborn baby will be at risk. Poor weight gain, especially in the third trimester, could result not only in low birth weight, but also infant mortality and intellectual disabilities. Pregnant women of normal weight should gain between 25 and 35 pounds in total through the entire pregnancy. Being underweight and overweight before pregnancy puts you at risk. Pregnant women with a pre-pregnancy BMI below 20 are at a higher risk of a preterm delivery and an underweight infant. Pregnant women with a pre-pregnancy BMI above 30 have an increased risk of the need for a C-section during delivery. Generally, women gain two to five pounds in the first trimester. After that, it's best not to gain more than one pound per week. Women who are pregnant with twins are advised to gain even more weight to ensure the health of their unborn babies. The pace of weight gain during pregnancy is also important. If a woman puts on weight too slowly, her physician may recommend nutritional counseling. On the other hand, if she gains weight too quickly, especially in the third trimester, it may be the result of edema, that's swelling due to excess fluid accumulation. Some steps to take to gain weight appropriately are to work with your healthcare provider, track weight throughout the pregnancy, limit added sugars and solid fats, know your caloric need, and work up to or maintain at least 150 minutes of moderate activity per week. The food safety for pregnancy suggestions listed below are to ensure that you don't get some bacterial infections from undercooked or raw food. Weight loss after pregnancy. New mothers who gain a healthy amount of weight and participate in regular physical activity during their pregnancies also have an easier time shedding weight after pregnancy. However, women who gain more weight than needed for a pregnancy typically retain that excess weight as body fat. If those few pounds increase a new mother's BMI by a unit or more, that could lead to complications such as high blood pressure or type 2 diabetes in future pregnancies or later in life. Pregnant women must consume more calories and nutrients in the second and third trimesters than other adult women. However, the average recommended daily caloric intake can vary depending on activity level and the mother's normal weight. Also, pregnant women should choose a high quality, diverse diet, consume fresh foods, and prepare nutrient-rich meals. It's also standard for pregnant women to take prenatal supplements to ensure adequate intake of the needed micronutrients. During the first trimester, a pregnant woman has the same energy requirements as normal and should consume the same number of calories as usual. As the pregnancy progresses, a woman must increase her caloric intake. She should consume an additional 340 calories per day during the second trimester and an additional 450 calories per day during the third trimester. The RDA of carbohydrates during pregnancy is about 175 to 265 grams per day to fuel fetal brain development. The best food sources for pregnant women include whole grain breads and cereals, brown rice, root vegetables, legumes, and fruits. These provide nutrients, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and fiber. They also help to build the placenta and supply energy for the growth of the unborn baby. During pregnancy, extra protein is needed for the synthesis of new tissues for both mom and baby. Protein builds muscle and other tissues, enzymes, antibodies, and hormones in both the mother and the unborn baby. Additional protein also supports increased blood volume and the production of amniotic fluid. Protein should be derived from healthy sources, such as lean red meat, white meat poultry, legumes, nuts, seeds, eggs, and fish. Low-fat milk and other dairy products also provide protein, along with calcium and other nutrients. Although there are no specific recommendations for fats in pregnancy, apart from following normal dietary guidelines, it's not recommended for pregnant women to be on a very low-fat diet, since it would be hard to meet the needs of essential fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins.
Fatty acids are important during pregnancy because they support the baby's brain and eye development. Fats can also help the placenta grow and may help to prevent premature birth and low birth weight. Ideally, a pregnant woman should eat 25 to 30 grams of dietary fiber per day. Insoluble fiber acts as a natural laxative, which softens stools and speeds the elimination of waste material through the colon to avoid constipation. Soluble fiber has little effect on the intestines. However, it helps to lower blood cholesterol levels and regulate blood glucose. Pregnant women should drink 2.3 liters, or roughly 10 cups, of liquids per day to provide enough fluid for blood production. It's also important to drink liquids during physical activity or when it's hot and humid outside to replace fluids lost to perspiration. The combination of a high fiber diet and lots of liquids also helps to eliminate waste. Pregnancy requires certain conditionally essential nutrients, which are nutrients that are supplied only under special conditions, such as stress, illness, or aging. Taking a daily prenatal supplement or multivitamin helps to meet many nutritional needs. Most of these requirements should be fulfilled with a healthy diet. The next two slides highlight the recommended nutrient intakes during pregnancy. The micronutrients involved with building the skeleton, vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, are crucial during pregnancy to support fetal bone development. There is an increased need for all B vitamins during pregnancy as well. Additional zinc is crucial for cell development and protein synthesis. The need for vitamin A also increases. An extra iron intake is important because of the increase in blood supply during pregnancy and to support the fetus and placenta. For most other minerals though, recommended intakes are similar to those for non-pregnant women. Although it's crucial for pregnant women to make sure to meet the RDA to reduce the risk of birth defects. In addition, pregnant mothers should avoid exceeding any recommendations. Nutrient dense foods, which are higher in proportion of macronutrients and micronutrients relative to calories, are essential to a healthy diet. Pregnant women should be able to meet almost all of their increased needs through a healthy diet. However, expectant mothers should take a prenatal supplement to ensure an adequate intake of iron and folate. Pregnant women should focus on iron-rich or iron-fortified foods. They should also include vitamin C-rich foods. They should eat a well-balanced diet, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, calcium-rich foods, lean meats, and a variety of cooked seafood, excluding fish that are high in mercury. Pregnant women should also drink additional fluids, especially water. There are a number of substances that can harm a growing fetus. Alcoholic beverages can cause a range of abnormalities that fall under the umbrella of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. There is no safe amount of alcohol that a pregnant woman can consume. Pregnant women should also limit caffeine. Some studies suggest that very high amounts of caffeine have been linked to babies born with low birth weights. Listeria monocytogenes is a species of pathogenic bacteria that causes the infection listeriosis. Listeriosis infection can cause spontaneous abortion and fetal or newborn meningitis, and pregnant women are 20 times more likely to become infected than non-pregnant healthy adults. Foods that are more likely to contain that bacteria are unpasteurized dairy products, especially soft cheeses, and also smoked seafood, hot dogs, pate, cold cuts, and uncooked meats. To avoid consuming contaminated foods, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding should take proper precautions. It's always important to avoid consuming contaminated food to prevent food poisoning. Vegetables should be washed thoroughly or have their skins removed to avoid heavy metals. Pregnant women can eat fish. However, they should avoid fish with high methylmercury levels such as shark, swordfish, tilefish, and king mackerel. Pregnant women should also avoid consuming raw shellfish to avoid foodborne illness. For most pregnant women, physical activity is a must and it is recommended. Brisk walking, swimming, or an aerobics class geared toward expectant mothers are all great ways to get exercise during pregnancy. 
Pregnant women should avoid pastimes that could cause injury, such as soccer, football, and other contact sports, or activities that could lead to falls, such as horseback riding and downhill skiing. Scuba diving should also be avoided because it might result in the fetus developing decompression sickness. Some common discomforts during pregnancy include back strain, swollen ankles, constipation, and hemorrhoids. Heartburn can occur during the early months of pregnancy due to an increase in the hormone progesterone, and during the later months due to the expanding size of the fetus. Other common complaints can include leg cramps and bloating. Regular exercise can help to alleviate these discomforts. Nausea and vomiting are GI issues that strike many pregnant women and are often referred to as morning sickness. Nausea usually subsides after 16 weeks, possibly because the body becomes adjusted to higher estrogen levels. It can be useful for pregnant women to keep a food diary to discover which foods trigger nausea. Food aversions and cravings don't have a major impact unless food choices are extremely limited. The most common food aversions are milk, meats, pork, and liver. For most women, it's not harmful to indulge in the occasional craving. Pika is willingly consuming foods with little or no nutritive value, such as dirt, clay, and laundry starch. One complication during pregnancy is gestational hypertension. That's a condition of high blood pressure during the second half of pregnancy. Hypertension can prevent the placenta from getting enough blood, which would result in the baby getting less oxygen and nutrients. If left untreated, it can cause preeclampsia, which is marked by elevated blood pressure and protein in the urine and is associated with swelling. About 4% of pregnant women suffer from a condition known as gestational diabetes, which is abnormal glucose tolerance during pregnancy. Signs and symptoms of this disease include extreme hunger or thirst or fatigue. If blood sugar levels are not properly monitored and treated, the baby might gain too much weight and require a C-section for delivery. Gestational diabetes usually resolves after childbirth. Diet and nutrition have a major impact on a child's development from infancy into the adolescent years. A healthy diet not only affects growth, but also immunity, intellectual capabilities, and emotional well-being. One of the most important jobs of parenting is making sure that children receive an adequate amount of needed nutrients to provide a strong foundation for the rest of their lives. Birth to age one. Healthy infants grow steadily, but not always at an even pace. Physicians and other health professionals can use growth charts to track a baby's development process. Growth charts may provide warnings that a child has a medical problem or is malnourished. Insufficient weight or height gain during infancy may indicate a condition known as failure to thrive. Requirements for macronutrients and micronutrients on a per kilogram basis are the highest during infancy than at any other stage in the human life cycle. For almost all infants six months or younger, breast milk is the best source to fulfill nutritional requirements. An infant may require feedings eight to 12 times a day or more in the beginning. After six months, infants can gradually begin to consume solid foods to help meet nutrient needs. A baby's resting metabolic rate is two times that of an adult. The RDA to meet energy needs changes as an infant matures and puts on more weight. How often an infant wants to eat will also change over time due to growth spurts, which typically occur at about two weeks and again at six weeks of age, and then again at about three months and six months of age. The dietary recommendations for infants are based on the nutritional content of human breast milk. Infants have a high need for protein to support growth and development, though excess protein can cause dehydration, diarrhea, fever, and acidosis in premature infants. A high fat diet is necessary to encourage the development of neural pathways in the brain and other parts of the body. Infants who are over the age of six months should not consume foods that are high in saturated fats and trans fatty acids, which inhibit growth. Almost all of the nutrients that infants require can be met if they consume an adequate amount of breast milk. Breast milk is low in vitamin D, which is needed for calcium absorption and building bone. Breast milk is also low in vitamin K, which is required for blood clotting. 
Also, breast milk is not high in iron, and after four to six months, an infant needs an additional source of iron other than breast milk. Infants have a high need for fluids. Children have larger body surface area per unit of body weight and a reduced capacity for perspiration. As solids are introduced, parents must make sure that young children continue to drink fluids throughout the day. Breastfeeding provides the fuel a newborn needs for rapid growth and development. The WHO recommends that breastfeeding be done exclusively for the first six months of an infant's life. New mothers must also pay careful consideration to their own nutritional requirements to help their bodies recover in the wake of pregnancy. Lactation is the production and secretion of breast milk. During the second and third trimesters, levels of the hormone prolactin increase to initiate and maintain milk production. Levels of the hormone oxytocin also rise to promote the release of breast milk when the infant suckles, which is known as the milk ejection reflex. Shortly after birth, the expulsion of the placenta triggers progesterone levels to fall, which activates lactation. New mothers need to adjust their caloric and fluid intake to make breastfeeding possible. The RDA is 330 additional calories during the first six months of lactation, and 400 additional calories during the second six months of lactation. Lactating women should also drink 3.1 liters of liquids per day. The RDA of nearly all vitamins and minerals increases for women who are breastfeeding their babies. Calcium requirements do not change during breastfeeding. Components of breast milk. Colostrum is produced immediately after birth and lasts for several days. Colostrum is thicker than breast milk and is yellowish or creamy in color. It's protein rich and fulfills an infant's nutrient needs during the early days. This special milk is high in fat soluble vitamins, minerals, and immunoglobulins or antibodies that pass from the mother to the baby. Two to four days after birth, the colostrum is replaced by transitional milk. Transitional milk lasts for approximately two weeks and contains high levels of fat, lactose, and water-soluble vitamins. It also contains more calories than colostrum. Mature milk is the final fluid that a new mother produces. In most women, it begins to secrete at the end of the second week post-childbirth. There are two types of mature milk that appear during a feeding. Four milk occurs at the beginning and includes water, vitamins, and protein. Hind milk occurs after the initial release of milk and contains higher levels of fat, which is necessary for weight gain. About 90% of mature milk is water. Lactoferrin, an iron-gathering complete protein in breast milk, helps the absorption of iron into an infant's bloodstream. A mother's diet can have a major impact on milk production and quality. Lactating mothers should avoid illegal substances, cigarettes, some legal drugs, and herbal products while breastfeeding. Lactating women can drink alcohol, though they must avoid breastfeeding until the alcohol has completely cleared from their milk. Breastfeeding boosts the baby's immune system and lowers the incidence of diarrhea, along with respiratory diseases, GI problems, and ear infections. Breastfed babies are less likely to develop asthma and allergies. Some studies suggest that breast milk may also improve an infant's intelligence and protect against type 1 diabetes and obesity. Breastfed infants are sick less often than bottle-fed infants. The skin-to-skin -skin contact of breastfeeding promotes a close bond between mother and baby. Breastfeeding helps a woman's bones stay strong, which protects against fractures later in life. Studies have also shown that breastfeeding reduces the risk of breast and ovarian cancers. There are some challenges that nursing mothers may face when starting and continuing to breastfeed their infants. These obstacles include painful engorgement or fullness in the breasts, sore and tender nipples, lack of comfort or confidence in public, and lack of accommodation to breastfeed or express milk in the workplace. Education, the length of maternity leave, and laws to protect public breastfeeding, among other measures, can all help to facilitate breastfeeding for many lactating women and their newborns. 
There are some contraindications to breastfeeding. A new mother with HIV should not breastfeed because the infection can be transmitted to the baby through the breast milk. However, in nations where HIV infection rates are high, acceptable infant formula can be difficult to come by. Inappropriate or contaminated bottle formulas cause 1.5 million infant deaths per year. Breastfeeding is also not recommended for women undergoing radiation or chemotherapy treatment. When breastfeeding is contraindicated for any reason, feeding a baby formula enables parents and caregivers to meet their newborn's nutritional needs. Bottle feeding. For parents who choose to bottle feed, infant formula provides a balance of nutrients. However, not all formulas are the same. Hypoallergenic protein hydrolysate formulas are usually given to infants who are allergic to cow's milk and soy protein. Preterm infant formulas are given to low birth weight infants if breast milk is unavailable. Infant formula comes in three basic types. Powder that requires mixing with water and it's the least expensive. Concentrates, which are liquids that must be diluted with water, or ready to use liquids that can be poured directly into bottles, and these are convenient for traveling. Most babies need about 2.5 ounces of formula per pound of body weight each day. All equipment used in formula preparation should be sterilized. Any prepared and unused formula should be refrigerated to prevent the growth of bacteria. Parents should make sure not to use contaminated water to mix formula in order to prevent foodborne illnesses. Always follow the instructions for powdered and concentrated formula carefully so that infants are getting the correct nutrient amount per serving. This slide highlights breast milk versus bottle formula. Introducing solid foods. Infants should be breastfed or bottle fed exclusively for the first six months of life. If parents try to feed an infant who is too young or is not ready, their tongue will push the food out, which is called an extrusion reflex. After six months, the suck-swallow reflexes are not as strong, and infants can hold up their heads and move them around, both of which make eating solid foods more feasible. Introducing solid foods. Usually, an infant cereal can be offered from a spoon between four to six months. By nine months to a year, infants are able to choose soft foods and can eat solids that are well chopped or mashed. Infants who are fed solid foods too soon are susceptible to developing food allergies. For this reason, when parents and caregivers introduce solids, they should feed their child only one new food at a time until they are sure there is no allergy. At six to seven months, infants can use their whole hand to pick up items, known as the palmer grasp. At eight months, a child might be able to use a pincer grasp, which uses fingers to pick up objects. After the age of one, children slowly begin to use utensils to handle their food. Feeding problems during infancy. Certain foods are choking hazards, including foods with skins or foods that are very small, such as grapes, raw carrots and apples, raisins, and hard candy. Parents should also avoid adding salt or seasonings to an infant's food. Keep in mind that an infant cannot communicate that the food is too hot, so care should be taken when heating food. Raw honey and corn syrup both contain spores of Clostridium botulinum, so those should be avoided. Overfed infants may develop dietary habits and metabolic characteristics that last a lifetime. Overnutrition and growth acceleration in infancy include long-term obesity along with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease later in life. Food allergies impact 4 to 6 percent of young children in America. Common food allergens include peanuts, peanut butter, egg whites, wheat, cow's milk, and nuts. Even a small amount of a dangerous food can prove to be life-threatening. If there's a family history of food allergies, it's a good idea to delay giving a child dairy products until one year of age, eggs until two years of age, and shellfish, fish, and nuts until the age of three. 
Even when an infant is at higher risk for food allergies, there is no evidence that alterations in a mother's diet makes a difference. Primary teeth are at risk for a disorder known as early childhood caries, which is an infectious disease of the mouth. This can come from breast milk, formula, juice, or other drinks fed through a bottle. Early childhood caries is caused not only by the kinds of liquids given to an infant, but also by the frequency and length of time that fluids are given. Letting a baby suck on a bottle longer than a meal time, either when awake or asleep, can also cause early childhood caries. Gastroesophageal reflux occurs when stomach muscles open at the wrong times and allow milk or food to back up into the esophagus. Symptoms in infants include severe spitting up, projectile vomiting, arching of the back as though in pain, refusal to eat or pulling away from the breast during feedings, gaggings or problems with swallowing, and slow weight gain. For most infants, making adjustments in feeding practices addresses these issues. Diarrhea is often caused by a GI infection and can dehydrate an infant. If an infant has had several bouts of this condition, they will need to replace lost fluids and electrolytes. Infant constipation is another common problem. This frequently begins when a baby transitions from breast milk to formula or begins eating solid foods. Common recommendations include feeding an infant on solid foods pureed pears or prunes, or providing barley cereal in place of rice cereal. Colic is a common problem during infancy, characterized by crankiness and crying jags. It's defined as crying that lasts longer than three hours per day for at least three days per week and for at least three weeks, which is commonly known as the rule of threes. Colicky babies may have stomachs that are enlarged or distended with gas. Whether breastfeeding or bottle feeding, it's important not to overfeed infants, which could make them uncomfortable and more likely to have crying fits. Newborn jaundice is a condition that can occur within a few days of birth and is characterized by yellowed skin or yellowing in the whites of the eyes. This disorder is caused by elevated levels of bilirubin in a baby's bloodstream. Jaundice develops when a newborn's liver does not efficiently remove bilirubin from the blood. There are several types of jaundice associated with newborns. Physiologic jaundice is the most common type. Breast milk jaundice tends to be genetic and there's no known cause. Breastfeeding jaundice, this occurs when an infant does not get enough milk. Treatment often involves increasing the number of feedings to increase bowel movements, which helps to excrete the bilirubin. Jaundice typically subsides with no lingering effects. Nutrition in the toddler years. By the age of two, children's physical growth and motor development slows compared to the progress they made as infants. However, toddlers experience enormous intellectual, emotional, and social changes. Parents of toddlers also need to be mindful of certain nutrition-related issues that may crop up during this stage of the human life cycle. A toddler's serving sizes should be approximately a quarter that of an adult's. One way to estimate serving sizes for young children is one tablespoon for each year of life. The energy requirements for ages two to three are about 1,000 to 1,400 calories a day. Toddlers require small, frequent, nutritious snacks and meals to satisfy energy requirements. This slide highlights serving sizes for toddlers. Macronutrients for toddlers. Toddlers' carbohydrate needs increase to support their body and brain development. Brightly colored, unrefined carbohydrates such as peas, orange slices, tomatoes, and bananas are not only nutrient dense, they also make a plate look more appetizing and appealing to a young child. Essential fatty acids are vital for the development of the eyes, along with nerve and other types of tissues. Micronutrients. As a child grows bigger, the needs for vitamins and minerals can be met with a balanced diet, with a few exceptions. Vitamin D fortified milk and cereals can help meet this need. However, toddlers who do not get enough of this micronutrient should receive a supplement. Iron deficiency is also a major concern for children between the ages of two and three. 
During this phase, it's important to offer children foods that they can handle on their own and that help them avoid choking and other hazards. Examples include fresh fruits that have been sliced into pieces, orange or grapefruit sections, peas or potatoes that have been mashed for safety, a cup of yogurt, and whole grain bread or bagels cut into pieces. Parents and other caregivers can help children learn how to feed themselves by providing the following. Small utensils that fit a young child's hand, small cups that will not tip over easily, plates with edges to prevent food from falling off, small servings on a plate, and high chairs, booster seats, or cushions to reach a table. Feeding problems in the toddler years. Possible obstacles include difficulty helping a young child overcome a fear of new foods or fights over messy habits at the dinner table. According to nutritionist Ellen Satter, parents are responsible for what their infants eat, while infants are responsible for how much they eat. In the toddler years and beyond, parents are responsible for what children eat, when they eat, and where they eat while children are responsible for how much food they eat and whether they eat. Satter states that the role of the parent or caregiver in feeding includes the following, selecting and preparing food, providing regular meals and snacks, making mealtimes pleasant, and showing children what they must learn about mealtime behavior, and avoiding letting children eat in between meal or snack times. High-risk choking foods. Big chunks of food should not be given to children under the age of four. Certain raw vegetables, such as baby carrots, whole cherry tomatoes, whole green beans, and celery are also serious choking hazards. Children at this stage are often picky about what they want to eat. Although it may seem as if toddlers should increase their food intake to match their level of activity, there is a good reason for picky eating. Food jags. For weeks, toddlers may go on a food jag and eat one or two preferred foods and nothing else as a way to assert their individuality and independence. Parents and caregivers should be concerned if the same food jag persists for several months instead of several weeks. Children should not be forced to eat foods that they do not want. Food jags do not have a long-term effect on a toddler's health and are usually temporary situations. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, in the past 30 years, obesity rates have more than doubled for all children, including infants and toddlers. Parents and other caregivers who are constantly on the go may find it difficult to fit home-cooked meals into a busy schedule and may turn to fast food and other conveniences that are quick and easy, but not nutritionally sound. Lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly in low-income neighborhoods where local stores and markets may not stock fresh produce or may have limited options. Physical inactivity is also a factor. To prevent or address toddler obesity, parents and caregivers can do the following. Eat at the kitchen table instead of in front of a television to monitor what and how much a child eats. Offer a child healthy portions. The size of a toddler's fist is an appropriate serving size. Plan time for physical activity, about 60 minutes or more per day. Toddlers should have no more than 60 minutes of sedentary activity, such as watching television, per day. The risk of early childhood caries continues as children begin to consume more foods with a high sugar content. According to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, Children between ages of 2 and 5 consume about 200 calories of added sugar per day. Toddlers should avoid processed foods, such as snacks from vending machines, and sugary beverages, such as soda. Parents also need to instruct a child on brushing their teeth at this time to help a toddler develop healthy habits and avoid tooth decay. Iron deficiency anemia occurs when an iron-deprived body cannot produce enough hemoglobin. In infants and toddlers, iron deficiency anemia can occur as young children are weaned from iron-rich foods. Parents and caregivers can help prevent iron deficiency anemia by adding more iron-rich foods to a child's diet, including lean meats, fish, poultry, eggs, legumes, and iron-enriched whole grain breads and cereals. 
Children may also be given a daily supplement using infant vitamin drops with iron or ferrous sulfate drops. Possible causes of toddler diarrhea include bacterial or viral infections, food allergies or lactose intolerance, and excessive fruit juice consumptions. Parents should contact a pediatrician if a toddler has had diarrhea for more than 24 hours, if the child is also vomiting, or if they exhibit signs of dehydration, such as a dry mouth or tongue, or sunken eyes, cheeks, or abdomen. Replacement of lost fluids and electrolytes, sodium and potassium, is the most effective treatment measure. Eating habits are typically formed within the first few years of life, and it's believed that they persist for years, if not for life. Parents must find a balance between providing a child with an opportunity for self-expression, helping a child develop healthy habits, and making sure that a child meets all of their nutritional needs. The foods you consume in your younger years will impact your health as you age, from childhood into the later stages of life. Good nutrition today means optimal health tomorrow.